the next item of business is portfolio questions, and I'll say it again, in order to get as many people in as possible, I want short and succinct questions and answers to match. I'm in a good mood at the moment. Um, number one, Fulton McGregor, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, to remind the Chamber and the PLO to the Health Secretary, to ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that the voices of young people are heard during the development of mental health services. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When we published our mental health strategy in March 2017, engagement and co-production with young people was a consistent theme. I valued the opportunity to hear young people's views firsthand through the work we carried out in conjunction with the Scottish Youth Parliament, Young Scot, Children in Scotland and many others. Those views were crucial to informing the final strategy. We continue to put young people's voices at the heart of the strategy and have had several strands of ongoing work which directly involve young people. And these include the Scottish Youth Commission on Mental Health, run by Young Scott, a review of PSE in schools, Strategy Action 1, an audit of rejected referrals to CAMS being run by SAMH, Strategy Action 18, work on transitions between CAMS and adult services being run by the Scottish Youth Parliament, Action, Strategy Action 21. All of this work is really valuable, and particularly so given that 2018 is the year of young people. We will continue to ensure that young people's voices are heard and acted upon, particularly as mental health is consistently mentioned as one of the top priorities for young people, if not the top priority. Fulton McGregor. I thank the Minister for that response. A couple of weeks ago, I held a roundtable meeting with the Children and Young People Cross-Party Group where a whole range of stakeholders contributing the subject of mental health and young people. A particular focus was given to that transition period that the Minister mentioned from CAMS to adult services between the ages of 16 and 18. How is the Government ensuring uh, that, the, that young people have a say in the services that are available for this particular group? Minister. Well, I thank the member for his interest in this issue and it's good to hear that there is a focus on transitions between CAMS and adult services. This is also one of the central themes that emerged during the Scottish Youth Parliament's Speak Your Mind campaign on mental health, which, is so, which has been so crucial to informing our strategy. As I mentioned in my first answer, the Scottish Youth Parliament is taking forward work on transitions and we want to focus on the use of anticipatory care plans and how they can be best used to support young people who transition between CAMS and adult services and between different CAMS services or indeed out of CAMS altogether. The Youth Parliament's work will ensure that the final anticipatory care plan has been designed by young people for young people. They held a discussion day event on the 24th of March, which I attended, and I'm looking forward to the final product being finalised and rolled out in the coming months. Oliver and Dale, briefly, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In Dumfries and Galloway, we've seen a 10% rise in the number of uh, temporary staff working in children and adolescent mental health. Does the Minister agree that this represents a huge challenge for running child-centred services and what action is the Scottish Government taking to address it? Minister. Well, can I say to the member that the key is early intervention and prevention. Yes, we're seeing uh, increasing numbers coming forward for CAMS, but we also want to make sure that the people are, direct, are, are appropriately referred and if it is not the CAMS specialist, uh, intervention that they required that the intervention at tiers one and two is, is also available. Question two, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how the digital health and care strategy will help to deliver person-centred care. Cabinet Secretary. Scotland's digital health and care strategy published last month highlights the opportunities that technology offers to empower citizens to better manage their health and well-being support independent living and gain access to services through digital means and to support a shift in the balance of care. The external expert panel highlighted that Scotland is an international leader in technology enabled care and our strategy sets out an ambition to widen and extend such services. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, answer. How does the digital health and care strategy contribute to the ongoing work on the integration of health and social care in our communities? And does she agree with me that the use of a mix of technology as well as traditional methods are key to delivering sustainable care now and in the future? Cabinet Secretary. So the strategy recognises the, the benefits of a 
focused approach to delivery and the eight uh, national health boards new uh, collaborative approach to offering an improvement and transformational change will uh, working along with the Scottish Government and COSLA, uh, the Local Government Digital Office, the Scottish so Social Services Council and the Care Inspectorate, they are going to be key to delivering on uh, these ambitions. And this is not about technology necessarily being the solution, but that wider service transformation will bring together expertise and knowledge with technology uh, uh, integral to helping that change uh, happen. Anna Sarwar. Deputy Presiding Officer, Cabinet Secretary will cover some of this uh, later, but what consideration has been given on the use of technology in crisis mental health situations so people can have rapid access to a counsellor or a psychologist to avoid them having a, a really tragic circumstance? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of, of course, there are already services like Breathing Space that provide um, very, very important um, services uh, to those uh, suffering uh, crisis. Uh, there is also uh, NHS 24 has been involved in providing uh, services that people can use online, um, uh, which are actually have, have been well um, evaluated. I think there's probably more that we can do uh, in that space, particularly for people who are living in more remote and rural communities, and that's something I'm certainly keen to explore. Question three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what work it is doing to assess and reduce the health impact of air pollution. Cabinet Secretary. Oh. No, no, I myself. <laughs> the Scottish Government takes the issue of air pollution very seriously and is committed to the protection of the public health public from the effects of poor air quality. Compared to the rest of the UK and other parts of Europe, Scotland enjoys a high level of air quality, but we cannot be complacent about this. Our Clean Air for Scotland strategy sets out an ambitious programme of action to promote air quality, and Scotland is the first country in Europe to pass legislation based on World Health Organisation guidelines for fine particulate matter. We're also providing pr practical and financial support to local authorities in tackling local air pollution hotspots. Plans are underway to have Scotland's first low emission zone in place in Glasgow by the end of 2018. Thank you, Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The situation, uh, particularly in Glasgow, is not as rosy uh, as I think the, the Minister says Scotland has great air quality. There are areas of Scotland which have consistently, over many, many years, failed to meet basic uh, air quality standards. And as someone who lives in one of those pollution hotspots, I agree with the opposition councillors who've called for a more rapid implementation of the low emission zone than the one the council proposes. That's a council decision, but what support will the Scottish Government give to Glasgow City Council to assess the difference in health impact that will be achieved from that more rapid implementation of the LEZ that the opposition parties are calling for in Glasgow? Minister. You know, we are working with uh, local authorities uh, around low emission uh, zones. Uh, again, I don't think it's uh, an overstating the fact that compared to the rest of the UK and other parts of Europe, Scotland enjoys high levels of air quality. But I never said, I never suggest for a minute that we're not working hard to make sure that we can do more where we can. We are absolutely not being uh, complacent. 10.8 million in funding has been allocated this financial year to support the implementation of local uh, low emission zones with a particular focus on setup costs and bus uh, retrofit, for example. Um, we'll continue to work with our local authorities' partners to make the improvement that we need. Kenneth Gibson, briefly, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Around 1.5 million people smoke in Scotland, and cigarette smoke contains over 4,500 compounds. These include acetaldehyde, a carcinogen, acetone, which damages the liver and kidneys, and ammonia, a cause of asthma and high blood pressure. Does the Minister agree that if we are serious about breathing clean air, we must continue to do everything possible to persuade people to quit smoking? Minister. Yeah, absolutely. I think we must continue to do everything possible to persuade people to stop smoking. Our efforts in Scotland on smoking rates have been bold and progress to make has been uh, good. We're also amongst the first in the world to set a tobacco-free target by 2034. Quitting is the best thing a smoker can do to improve their health and we can encourage any smoker to try quitting their own way and to make use of the free stop smoking support available to them. Also point the member to the Quit Your Way campaign uh, that we have a uh, been taken forward to ensure that uh, and people understand the many different ways they can get support to help them uh, quit the habit. Question four, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact it expects minimum unit pricing of alcohol will have on health. Cabinet Secretary. 
Last week saw the introduction of a minimum price of 50 pence per unit of alcohol. The University of Sheffield modelling estimates that in the first year, this will result in 58 fewer alcohol-related deaths and nearly 1,300 fewer alcohol-related hospital admissions. And over a five-year period, we could expect 392 fewer alcohol-related deaths and 8,254 fewer alcohol-related hospital admissions. The monitoring and evaluation plan for minimum unit pricing being led by NHS Health, Health Scotland includes examining the impact on alcohol-related harms. Claire Adams. Thank you, Presiding <coughs> Officer, and thank you uh, to the Cabinet Secretary for our answer. The recent figures uh, in 2016 in North Lanarkshire show that there were 122 alcohol-related deaths costing NHS Lanarkshire, uh, North Lanarkshire an estimated £116 million. So I'm very pleased to hear the Cabinet Secretary say that minimum unit pricing should go some way to reducing these. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that minimum unit pricing model that Scotland is introducing is one that other countries will be paying close attention to with a view to rolling out elsewhere? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the Welsh Assembly introduced legislation for minimum unit pricing of alcohol in October uh, last year. The Government of Ireland's Public Health Alcohol Bill includes a provision for minim minimum unit pricing and passed the second stage in the lower house in March this year. And on uh, Tuesday, the Parliamentary uh, Under Secretary of State and Social Care, Steve Brian MP confirmed that the UK government is commissioning Public Health England to review the evidence for minimum unit pricing in England. Uh, I also understand the Australian Northern Territories are currently considering a minimum floor price for alcohol. I think it's a landmark policy that other countries around the world are watching Scotland with interest. Thank you, David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that Parliament has already passed the social responsibility levy and it's up to government whether it's implemented. Will the Cabinet Secretary have a look at, again at that levy? This could help fund third sector groups at local level, at local level to try and help fight the problems caused by drink-related problems. Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, um, the... Uh, Additional revenue that was uh, predicted by Sheffield University is uh, very much an, an estimate and uh, we will, through the evaluation, see where any additional revenues fall and I think it's important as we explored at the Health Committee to understand where that falls. The social responsibility levy was always considered to be a local mechanism uh, to be able to be used uh, to address local circumstances. But as I said uh, at the Health Committee, these are things that we will keep under uh, review uh, as the uh, policy goes forward and something I'm uh, happy to keep members informed about. Thank you. Question five, Claire Baker. The Scottish Government, what discussions it has had with Fife Health and Social Care Partnership since its decision to suspend overnight out of hours services in Dunfermline, St Andrews and Glenrothes. Cabinet Secretary. So the decision to move to contingency measures for the provision of the out of hours service in Fife was taken for reasons of patient safety. Officials are in regular contact with Fife Health and Social Care Partnership regarding these measures and the ongoing situation. Claire Baker. Uh, following the closure of the out of hours services, the Director of Health and Social Care highlighted growing difficulties to curing clinical cover of both GPs and nurses as a result of national shortages. In Fife, these are well-known difficulties, with many practices struggling to get GPs during the day, never mind at night. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept the Government's responsibility in creating this situation? And given these concerns, is she confident the services in Dunfermline, Glenrothes and St Andrews will reopen in two months' time when they are up for review? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as uh, Claire Baker knows, uh, the changes to out of hours primary care services uh, are a short-term measure that uh, was uh, in the interest of patient safety, as I said in my initial answer. NHS Fife are reviewing they are longer term arrangements for out of hours care and have undertaken an option appraisal exercise. A public consultation will commence in June prior to any permanent decisions being uh, made and we'll continue to liaise with NHS Fife throughout uh, the review process. Uh, Claire Baker talked about the issue of GP uh, recruitment and obviously there are uh, some significant issues uh, in Fife with GP recruitment and retention. We believe that the new GP contract, along with the £110 million investment in primary care in this year alone, will help to um, 
make general practice uh, more attractive and will help to um, build on the local innovation uh, over uh, the last few years and through the recruitment and retention fund for example we think that that will be of assistance uh, to local areas uh, seeking to recruit i should also say that the workforce plan published recently has a commitment to um, an additional 800 gps over the next 10 years jenny gilrood Okay. Mm. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns that no quality impact assessment was carried out prior to the temporary closure of Glenrothes hospitals out of our service, and particularly given that this was a key recommendation of the Ritchie Review, and given that one in three children in Glenrothes live in poverty? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I understand that an quality impact assessment wasn't completed due to the emergency nature of the contingency arrangements. The contingency arrangements were put in place as a result of clear clinical advice and although a formal equality impact assessment wasn't carried out I have been advised by the Fife Health and Social Care Partnership that the impact on various communities and groups was part of the decision making process in terms of the contingency An equality impact assessment has been completed in relation to the longer term plans for the service and this uh, will continue to be updated. Question six, Gail Ross. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what funding packages are in place to meet the expenses of people who have to travel considerable distances to access health care, including outside their own NHS board area. Cabinet Secretary. There are a range of options available to patients who require financial assistance with travel costs. This includes the Scotland-wide Patient Travelling Expenses Scheme for those on qualifying benefits and the Highlands and Islands Travel Scheme, which provides assistance to all those living in remote areas. In addition, all health boards have the discretion to reimburse patient travelling expenses where it is viewed to be an extension of treatment costs and deemed to be clinically necessary. Gail Ross. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. She will be aware that there are some people in Caithness, Sutherland and Ross that have had to travel for miles to access specialist care in Ragmore Hospital in Inverness, some having to take days off work, often for minor appointments. Can she tell me how the introduction of the video conferencing Near Me service will change that and will we see it rolled out to other remote and rural areas? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, NHS Near Me uh, uses the nationally available Attend Anywhere video consultation service funded by the Scottish Government's Technology Enabled Care Programme. And this provides a, a secure video consultation environment for any service delivery organisation and can be accessed anywhere by a member of the public using a web browser or app on their laptop, tablet or smartphone. Within Highland, Near Me has had an initial focus on supporting the Caithness area whilst developing the service, but they're now working closely with the Scottish Centre for Telehealth and Telecare to roll this out into further areas in that region. An uptake of this service continues to increase and can, of course, prevent people from having to travel unnecessarily. Edwin Mount. Thank you, <clears throat> Presiding Officer. Given that we are 18 months post a major service redesign in Caithness Hospital, does the Cabinet Secretary believe the 200-odd mothers and their families travelling to the maternity unit at Rake Moor should be provided with suitable accommodation at the hospital, which sadly is still below what was agreed as being suitable? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, of course, uh, Edward Mountain will be well aware um, of the, uh, the reasons for the, the change of status of Caithness Maternity Unit being made by NHS Highland on the grounds of safety informed by the review they commissioned after the death of a child in September 2015. Uh, in terms of the issue of Rake Moore and making sure that accommodation is suitable, uh, that is an issue that has been raised uh, with NHS Highland uh, on a number of occasions to impress upon them the importance uh, and I understand that they have uh, taken action to make improvements on the, the Rigmore site and uh, that is something that I will continue to, to press them on. Question 7, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to consult people in remote and rural areas on the impact of the new GP contract. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government commissioned Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland to engage with patients across Scotland, including those in rural areas, on the new contract. The Alliance will be publishing a report on that engagement soon, which will provide valuable feedback to local health and social care partnerships currently developing their primary care improvement plans. These plans set out how the new GP contract will be implemented locally to best meet the needs of patients. Rhoda Grant. 
The contra a contract based on the number of appointments does not take account of travelling time for rural GPs. They have more home visits due to the lack of public transport in rural areas where frail elderly people can't come to the surgery. The contract shows no recognition whatsoever of the difference in rural practice. Neither does the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, which is used, show rural deprivation, meaning rural GPs are missing out again. Scottish Government have not heard their no, rural please, GPs, question. far less their patients. How are they going to rectify this situation and ensure that everyone has access to a GP going forward? Cabinet Secretary. So the Scottish Government, in collaboration with the Scottish uh, General Practitioners Committee of the BME, uh, is establishing the, the Rural Short Life Working Group, which will, uh, will work with rural stakeholders to help to assist in the implementation of the new uh, GP contract. I understand that the first meeting of that group will happen uh, later on uh, this month. Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much. Uh, following on from that response, can the Cabinet Secretary advise the pa Parliament on the time frame for that short life working group? And will she also ensure that there are island representatives on that short life uh, working group to reflect the specific issues uh, that arise in island communities? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I um, can say to, to the member, obviously, that um, as I reiterated in my, my last uh, answer, that there, the group will meet uh, later this month. Um, there has been a lot of effort put into looking at the membership of the group, and as I understand it, uh, there is an island representation on that group. I'm uh, happy to write to the member with further details uh, of, of who they are. Question nine, Ruth McGuire. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures quality is embedded and evidenced in drug and alcohol services. Minister. In 2014, we developed the quality principles which define the standards that people can expect when using a treatment service. These principles put the person at the centre and build a recovery plan around their strengths. In 2015, the Government commissioned the Care Inspectorate to support alcohol and drug partnerships to evaluate service quality against those principles. We were assured quality was embedded in our services and that they worked for recovery, but there is always room to do more and local improvement plans are in place to evidence this. Ruth McGuire. Thank the Minister for that answer. Is the Minister aware of the high quality cafe solace in my constituency? A huge part of its success comes from taking a whole population approach to tackling challenges faced by our community and both tackling food poverty and providing people in recovery a way to build skills and give back to the locally. Will the Minister join me this summer to visit cafe solace and meet with peer mentors and see firsthand this high quality COSLA gold winning work? Minister. I'm absolutely happy to um, meet with the member and to visit and learn more about this excellent work and understand that Cafe Solace also uh, won last year a COSLA Excellence Award. So absolutely uh, uh, happy to come to uh, the member's constituency and see firsthand the work that they do. And of course, I've been fortunate, very fortunate to visit a number of recovery communities across Scotland, of which there are now over 120, and to have the opportunity to speak to many people for whom these communities act as a foundation of the recovery from drug and alcohol use. Uh, those community initiatives are incredibly important, so I would absolutely uh, welcome the opportunity to see the good work happening in the members' constituency. Neil Finlay. Um, today's global drugs uh, survey showed the extent of drugs use in Scotland with users taking more cocaine in a single session than anywhere else in the world and deliveries of drugs quicker than a pizza. Um, I'm coming across more and more people who are very seriously affected uh, by their, their mental health affected and their physical health by cocaine use. If we're looking at evidence-led drugs policy, then is this evidence and the level of drug deaths in Scotland not evidence enough that our policy is failing? Minister. We have made a number of uh, advancements through the current strategy. We have a low number of young people taking drugs. There is a declining number of people taking drugs. But I absolutely recognise the member makes, and I know he's shaking his head, but I absolutely recognise the point he makes around the issues that we've seen in the press today around cocaine. And I absolutely recognise that every year we see the drug deaths. That's why I've taken the decision to refresh our current approach, to build on the strengths that we have existing in Scotland, but to do more to recognise the change in landscape of drug use uh, in Scotland. And, you know, if the member wants to bring to me some constructive ideas, then absolutely, uh, and my door is absolutely open, as opposed to continually criticising from the sidelines. And it's an important issue. I don't want to get hung up on party politics on this. So please come to my office, meet with me, tell me your ideas, and we'll make sure they're part and parcel of the new strategy that I'm taking forward. Question 10, Marie Goujon. 
to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation of its mental health strategy. Minister. I will present an annual report on the strategy's actions to the Scottish Parliament in the summer. Progress reports for all act 40 actions in the strategy were uploaded to the Scottish Government website in December. We also uploaded a report summarising progress on key deliverables in December. I'd be happy to provide the member with links to these reports. Additionally, we held the second biannual forum of stakeholders on the 6th of December. The forum is intended to track progress on the actions in the strategy and to help develop new actions in future years to help meet our ambitions. I spoke at the meeting in December about our achievements over the previous half year, the challenges ahead and the roles for everyone involved going forward. Marie Goujon. I was contacted by a pressure group from Mackey Academy in Stonehaven who were concerned about the support available for teenagers and children struggling with mental health issues, particularly relating to a lack of training in GPs with some children <coughs> being told that they were going through a phase and asking that training in mental health be included as part of teacher training for early intervention. Given that early intervention is so vitally important, can the Minister outline how funding for the mental health strategy is being targeted in that regard and are measures such as having on-site counsellors or CPNs in schools actively being considered? Minister. Uh, well, can I thank Mary Gujong for that question? I completely agree that focusing on prevention and early intervention is fundamentally important if we are to achieve the vision and aspirations of our mental health strategy. Training has a central role to play in this, and that's why action two in the strategy, for example, is to roll out improved mental health training for those who support young people in educational settings. Since 2014, the Scottish Government has provided £6,000 per annum to Education Scotland to roll out Scotland's mental health first aid training for children and young people to local authorities. The aim of this is to train staff within secondary school communities in order to increase their confidence in approaching pupils who they think might be struggling with a mental health problem. And this training uh, will complement a range of mental health strategies that are already in place within local authorities. Mary Fee. To ensure the mental health strategy 2017 to 2027 is delivering for people, it would be beneficial to know when each action should be implemented. Can the Minister tell me why the strategy has very few timescales attached to the actions set out? Minister. Well, as the member rightly said, the strategy is for over 10 years. Some actions have already been implemented, but uh, on the Scottish Government, uh, we certainly have a timeline for each strategy, and I monitor that closely to see how each action is progressing, and I can provide the member with further details on that if she wishes. Question 11, Michelle Ballard. <coughs> to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on concerns regarding the overuse of antidepressants. Minister. People experiencing mental ill health should expect the same standard of care as people with physical illness and should receive medication if they need it. The prescription of any medication, including antidepressants, is a clinical decision made in discussion with the patient, and there is good evidence that health professionals assess and treat depression appropriately. We are also committed to improving access to alternatives, such as psychological therapies, that increase choice and best accommodate patient preference. The Scottish Government supports services provided by breathing space, and NHS Living Life to people experiencing depression and is a key element of wider work across Scotland to intervene early and prevent problems from becoming worse. This aligns well with our policy on improving prevention and intervening early, which is one area of focus for our new 10-year mental health strategy. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you for that. The number of children under 18 being prescribed antidepressants doubled from 2,748 in 2009-10 to 5,572 in 2016. Whilst this might reflect an increase in the demand for child and adolescent mental health services, it potentially highlights a worrying reliance on pharmacological solutions to mental health. Does the Scottish Government not agree that 10-minute GP appointments, combined with a lack of appropriate mental health services, is leading to an over-dependence on pharmacological solutions, which is having a devastating impact on countless lives across Scotland? Minister. 
Well, as I said to my member in my first answer, the uh, prescription of antidepressants is a clinical decision and it's not for government to intervene in clinical decisions. But as I also said, the, uh, uh, the importance is to have alternative therapies and to have quick responses to people who have, and, and young people who have mental health problems. And that's why in the shift towards more emphasis on primary care, we are making sure that counsellors are available early instead of people having to wait longer in CAMS services, but I am also making sure that CAM services uh, are moving towards meeting their waiting time targets. Question 12, Tom Arthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how it supports participation in, support, in sport in the Renfrewshire South constituency. Minister. The Scottish Government remains committed to encouraging more people to take part in sport and physical activity at all levels. Sport Scotland invests directly in East Renfrewshire and Renfrewshire Council, which covers the parliamentary constituency of Renfrewshire South, to support a number of programmes and outcomes in school sport, club sport and coaching and volunteering. For example, in 2016-17, there were 412,000 uh, visits uh, to active school activities across the East Renfrewshire and Renfrewshire, and there are now 11 community sports hubs up and running. Oh, Martha. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, Barhead Youth Football Club has recently increased and expanded the number of girls' teams at various age levels, which I know are already hugely popular. Uh, will the Minister join me in congratulating Barhead YFC on its fantastic work, and can she outline how the Government supports opportunities for girls and women to participate in football? Minister. Absolutely, we'll uh, join the member in congratulating the work that's going on uh, in Barhead uh, and all the, the work that's going on across uh, football, the length and breadth of, of the country. We had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to celebrate some of that good work uh, in the Parliament uh, and to recognise the real effort that's been made to ensure that women get the chance and girls get the chance to participate in the beautiful game. Our Girls Our Game is the hashtag that is used, so if anybody's got the chance to uh, look at the uh, Twitter uh, world, then they can see just exactly how much fantastic work driven by a number of volunteers supported by the SFA and others to make sure girls get the ch chance and opportunity to play football. Thank you. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding <coughs> Officer. And just to ask the Minister if she's working on uh, delivering us a physical literacy pathway which would include preschool physical activity into school physical education and on into the third sector and communities where we make sure that the opportunities to that access are, are as easy as they possibly be, can be for sport and physical activity. Minister. We're uh, actively uh, working on a physical activity plan and absolutely making sure that all ages and stages uh, and, and all efforts and policies at those ages and stages are linked appropriately into the work that we're taking forward. So, for instance, the work that's ongoing around play makes, it, makes the, uh, a, a very good uh, link into the work that we're wanting to take forward to ensure young people in particular get the coordination skills, the fine motor, gross motor skills that they require to enable them to either continue to be active or to participate and proceed into sport at uh, all levels uh, and hopefully we hope uh, maybe be on the podium like the member once was a few years ago. Question, <laughs> question 13, <laughs> Rona Mackay. Thank you, President. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board. Cabinet Secretary. Ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, to discuss matters of importance to local people. Rona Mackay. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. There's a campaign in my constituency to have an outpatient chemotherapy service at Straub Hill Hospital, as was originally planned when the new hospital opened in 2010. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this service, where appropriate, should be available closer to home to avoid patients having to make tiring journeys before and after treatment? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I am familiar with the campaign and have indeed over few years met some of the campaigners and I understand though that the expert clinical view is that local people are best served by receiving treatment at the specialist Beetson Oncology Centre in Glasgow. That said, I know that the Health Board has assured local campaigners that they will keep the service under review to consider what other local provision would be possible and appropriate. Question 14, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to ensure all eligible men in Scotland receive an MP MRI before a prostate biopsy. Cabinet Secretary. 
Multi-parametric uh, MRI scans are currently being trialled to examine the feasibility and safety of uh, them as a diagnostic tool in men with uh, prostatic uh, disease. The initial results of this uh, study indicate that MRI could be used as a diagnostic tool in the future and might uh, in time decrease the need for traditional prostate biopsies. Our national, clinical, our national advisory group, such as the National Cancer Clinical Services Group, will keep studies such as this in mind when developing future cancer services in Scotland. Mark Griffin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In December 2016, the Cabinet Secretary announced the formation of a uro urology cancer services review, recognising that prostate cancer is the most common cancer amongst men and will be the most common cancer in the country by 2030, but that review hasn't reported back yet. In September 2017, the Cabinet Secretary also created the Ministerial Cancer Performance Group, but it won't re report back until the Urolo Urology Service review reports back. Can this Cabinet Secretary say when the Urology Service review will report back, and if the adoption of the MPMRI has been included in the scope of that review? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, what I will do is uh, I will uh, write to Mark Griffin uh, with an update on the timeline for the urology services review that he's asked for. Um, getting urology right in Scotland is very, very important because that is where there are the most difficulties in recruiting us to urology services and uh, is one of the, the challenges uh, around uh, the delivery of the, the cancer targets uh, at the moment. The urology is one of the most difficult. So I will get back to him on the uh, time frame for the services review. Uh, in terms of the, the MPMRI question, I think I answered in my, my first answer that really uh, this is um, being looked at um, as a study at the moment to make sure that we uh, gain the, the clinical uh, evidence and we would rely on groups such as the National Cancer Clinical Services Group uh, to advise on whether that should be ruled out. But again, happy to keep Mark Griffin uh, updated as, as they come forward with further information. Question 15, Alexander Burnett. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that all NHS boards provide out-of-hours dental care. Cabinet Secretary. The responsibility for ensuring access to out-of-hours emergency care for patients registered with a dentist under the NHS rests uh, with their dentists. The Scottish Government has provided additional funding to NHS boards to put in place out-of-hours services with appointments being triaged by NHS 24 in line with national clinical guidance. The specific arrangements for providing any required out-of-hours care for patients who have been triaged are for the relevant NHS board in conjunction with practitioners who have the responsibility responsibility towards their patients. Alexander Burnett. Can I thank you for your answer? Uh, being from a rural constituency, many of my constituents understand they need to make some travel to reach health appointments. However, a constituent of mine was told two weeks ago that the only available out-of-hours dental care was at a centre that would require a 110-mile round trip. So will the Cabinet Secretary look into ensuring that out-of-hours dental care can be made available but does not require such a lengthy journey? Uh, briefly, Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I am aware that NHS Grampian is conducting a review of their out-of-hours dental care. Um, no decision has been made at this stage, but the board is currently looking at how to deliver the most effective service provision for patients. So I'll make sure the member is kept informed of the outcome of that. And Mr Scott, you've managed it this time. Your patience. Number 16, Tavis Scott. You me called there, uh, the Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government, in light of the reported comments by the Health Secretary regarding cooperation between NHS boards, that there will be a regional structure in place, whether it will provide further details of this policy and what the implications are for regional NHS boards. Cabinet Secretary. So we've been clear that there are no plans to reduce the number of territorial health boards. Our focus is on ensuring better joint working between NH board, NHS boards and other partners through more effective regional planning of services. As part of this, three regional implementation leads have been selected from the existing cohort of NHS board chief execs. Working uh, with NHS boards and their partners, they're leading the overall design and planning of services at a regional level to provide better patient outcomes and more efficient and sustainable services. This must be brief. I'm grateful for the clarification. Uh, is the Shetland Health Board in the north uh, plan, in the north area that she described? Is there a regional plan and has that been submitted to the government? And when will it be published? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, we have had um, draft plans from the uh, regions and uh, they will be embarking um, uh, over the summer uh, with uh, public engagement uh, to discuss some of the, the, the detail of those plans and hopefully Tavish Scott will have the opportunity to attend one of those events. Uh, thank you. That concludes portfolio questions and I'm still in a good mood. Um, that moves on to next.